God, thank you so much for this day. Uh, thank you for us being able to come here and talk about you. Uh, we love you so much. Uh, just be uh, in this auditorium. Uh, help the words that are spoken uh, reach somebody who needs to know more about you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So today, guys, we are going to be talking about a different topic. We're going to get started on the fall, but I have a story for you guys before we begin. Uh, and Coach Rumbuck is never here when chapel is, I guess, because uh, she's sick today, and she was sick the last time I was talking. Uh, but Mrs. Barnett, Coach Rumbuck, and I were hanging out at my house this summer, and it got really late. Like, it was like nighttime, and we all decided we wanted to have a fire. Actually, I think, if I'm honest, I decided I wanted to have a fire, uh, and I know the right way to start a fire. Like, I, like, I've been in the military, so I know how to, like, do it with sticks or, like, flint and tinder. Like, I know all the, like, really the ways you're supposed to start a fire that are safe. But turns out this summer, like I'm talking about, like, a couple months ago, I was just really impatient, and I just wanted to throw out all that out the window. Like, I knew my parents talked about fire safety with me. Uh, the firefighters like came to our school growing up and would say like, hey, this is what you don't do to start a fire. And that's what I decided to do. So me and my Crocs, because I'm a Croc person when I'm not at school, and shorts, uh, went outside and I had like one of those long candle lighters and some gasoline. Yeah. And so I poured it all over the fire and I, I bend down, like I'm going to start the fire, and I become like, like the, the night sky lights up. And I jump back, thankfully, fast enough to where my face isn't like in it, but from my knees down, oh, when I go like that, yeah, okay, I won't. Uh, I become a human fireball, all right? And it was so bright that Mrs. Barnett and Coach Rumbuck saw it from inside the house, and when I hobbled back in, they're like, what happened? Uh, and then their nose crinkles, and they're like, what is that smell? And then I smell it too, and it's like the worst smell I've ever smelled in my life. And it was my burnt hair and burnt flesh from the fire. So like from my knees down, I had no hair, and there were like five shades of red, like all different shades of red. It was horrible. I took off my croc, and my croc had protected my foot somehow. So like half of my foot was like the same red color, and then half of it was like a normal color from the croc. And right after it, and now even, I started asking myself, like, what was my problem? Like, what was I thinking? Why did I ever think that was like a good idea? And I, I don't really have a good answer for that, because I knew the right way to start a fire, and I knew the wrong way, and I chose the wrong way. And today, because we're talking about the fall, Adam and Eve are told like what they should do, and they choose not to do what they are told they should do, and that's what we're going to be talking about the rest of the day today. But remember, uh, everything we do this year is all about why we should have a relationship with God, why we should want that. So our theme is redeemed, which means you're saved from something you deserve, which is hell. Because someone else, someone being Jesus, paid the price for you. And then last week we talked about being made in the image of God. And I really love this line. That's why I put it back up there. You can't know what it means to be made in the image of God if you don't know God. Makes sense, right? But today uh, we're talking about the fall. And there's some big questions that go along with the fall. Like one in particular. Uh, so sometimes... Like me, like if, if you, like I think back on it, like I've, I have friends that I know they're going to get in trouble or hurt themselves with a decision they're about to make. And I just like think like, what's their problem? Like, why are they doing that? That doesn't make any sense. And then sometimes when I watch the news, I'll think, man, what's the world's problem? Uh, and then much like this summer, 
And if you guys are all honest, you all have asked this to, of yourself probably before. But thinking back on that, I'm like, what was I thinking? What's my problem? And that's the big question that is, like, is going to be what we're answering by talking about the fall. Because the truth is, all of us have this brokenness that we can't shake. And on top of that, we've, we've either wronged somebody, uh, we've been wronged by somebody, and we have somebody that probably we love that is sick or we've lost, and it all starts with the fall. So the story, and I know this is a lot, I don't usually put this much on the, on the screen, but the story goes like this, and a lot of y'all have heard it before. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So the last verse, it says husband was with her, so Adam was there also for this, and they both knew that the fruit was off limits. They knew God told them to do one thing, and they chose to do something different. And what I want to, like, what went wrong there? Because they had like, they were like in the garden, everything was nice and perfect, and they got to walk with God, that's pretty cool. And then it all got messed up by this one choice. So what went wrong? And it goes along with the question, what is wrong with us? See, Adam and Eve fell for half-truths. That's what Satan does. They were lured in by the promise that you'll be like God. That was what got them. And so they, they pretty much said, you know, I know you're saying this, God, but I'm a better master of my life than, than you are. And any time when we know what the Bible says or what God is telling us in a certain situation and we choose to do what's different, that is actually what we're saying too. It's a pride thing. It all boils down to pride. It's almost like they said to God, like, hey, you know, God, I get it, but I got this. Which is never, like, when I've heard that phrase, you know, like, stand back, I got this, in, like, the general world, it's never a good thing. It's the equivalent of, hey, y'all, watch this if you're in the country. And it usually ends with somebody hurt or, like, doing something really not smart. So pride is one of the biggest things the Bible talks about. One of the things that it spends the most time talking about. Um, here's some examples. Pride goes before destruction. Uh, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. See, pride isn't merely a sin. It's literally the root cause of most other sins that we like, fall victim to, most temptations that we go through. Uh, when we say, I'm a better master for myself, than God is, that's when we get into tough situations. And that's when it never ends well. It reminds me of, there's so many stories of when little kids are told by their parents, hey, don't touch the stove. I think most of y'all have heard that before. Don't touch the stove, that's not good. But most little kids that I've heard of still eventually touch the stove. I did. That shouldn't surprise you, but I did. I was one of those. And see, parents were trying to protect their kid, but the kid thought they knew better. Bless you. That was so loud. Uh, <laughs> sorry. When I was in fourth grade, there was a kid in my neighborhood who like, literally used a butterfly knife and would walk around uh, using a butterfly knife, like doing uh, tricks and stuff. So it's like literally a knife. Wow. Uh, that is, that you can 
uh, flip around your hand, and you can like flip it back and forth. And my parents made it very clear that I was not to play with the butterfly knife. They're like, don't, don't mess with that. And I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I won't. But one time I was outside without my parents, and I was thinking, and at first I was like, yeah, I shouldn't play with that. And then I was like, well, what could go wrong? So I decided to ask to play with the butterfly knife. And within two seconds, my hand was cut so bad that it was like pooling over with blood, like falling to the ground. I had to get stitches and everything. I don't know which one it actually is, but I think these are age lines. One of them isn't because one of them is a scar from that situation. So I know parents aren't always perfect. I'm not perfect as a parent. But God is, and when he tells us to do something, when he told Adam and Eve, hey, don't touch that, don't do that, and we sh they should have listened. He knew what was best for them. So then, how do they fall victim to this? And it's all about how Satan deceives, and he's really strategic about how he deceives people. He, he starts by saying, you know, you will not. You won't certainly die. That's how he starts. And is that a lie? It's yes and no, actually, in the moment, because she didn't die immediately. It was years before she died. But that is what Satan does. He deals in, like, these half-truths where he misinforms. Did God really say, don't eat from that tree? Did he really? Are you sure? He misdirects. Hey, don't worry about the fact that you're disobeying God. Look at the pretty fruit over here. And he misrepresents. He makes sin look appealing to us. Satan rarely makes promises he doesn't initially and partially keep. I want that to stick with you. If Satan were like to tempt you, if you were tempted and you knew that the result was you going to jail, uh, that wouldn't be very appealing to you. But if you knew the result was something that was probably going to keep you out of trouble or make your life easier for a second, you might be more willing to make the bad decision or the wrong choice. He keeps the price of that sin hidden. So my story doesn't actually end, my butterfly knife story doesn't end with my hand being cut because I have to go tell my parents. And I'm rushing in, like blood is literally gurgling out of my, my hand, and I'm like, Mom, Dad, I cut my hand on a big rock. And for like a solid year, that was the story I stuck to, you, was I cut my hand on a big rock, because in the moment, it was, in my mind, super easy, a lot easier than telling the truth. But every like few days, every few weeks, they would ask me about this story, and I'd have to like put another lie on top of that lie. And it got real confusing after a while. And plus, I was super stressed out. I was feeling guilty about it. So one day, again, like a year later, so I'm not, not great. But I was like, you know, Mom, Dad, I, I use that butterfly knife that you told me not to. That's what it was. I'm sorry. And they're like, Finally, that's what my parents said, finally we've been waiting for you to tell me us this entire time. So they knew the whole time, they were just waiting for me to choose to do the right thing. And then they said, hey, by the way, you're grounded, which like that was expected. But we don't see the real cost of sin a lot of times. And that's what I want to get all of you to understand. Everything the Bible says not to do, guys, actually is something that leads us to a better life. God is not a buzzkill that is just telling you not to do things just because. Like, the Bible's not a list of rules. It's not. God, the Bible is about a story of who God is and what he did for us. And the things that God tells us to do actually lead us to a better life. And I want you to really understand this. And if we could just think through and see where everything that we're doing, kind of if we're sinning 
or falling into temptation, and we look at the grand scheme, the grand picture, uh, then like I put three up there, it would be a lot easier to resist temptations. So first one, I mean, you can look at any sin and do this with. The first one is gossip, talking bad about people. So like sometimes you do that and it feels good, it makes you fit in, makes you think that like, like you're like hanging out with somebody else and they appreciate the fact that you're gossiping about someone. But eventually, if you keep doing that, one, it's going to get back to people that you're talking bad about them. And two, you're literally, like, eventually, like, if you get bad enough about it, there's going to be a lot of people that don't want to be around you anymore because they know that you're going to start talking bad about them. The second one is actually super easy, and I'll tell you why to understand where it leads. Unforgiveness. So, like, if somebody does something mean to you and you're like, I'm never forgiving you ever, a lot of times that person doesn't care or they wouldn't have done it in the first place. So, like, who are you actually hurting by not forgiving them? Yourself, right? So, like, you're bitter and you're angry and you're getting more bitter and more angry because you're not forgiving people, but really they don't even a lot of times care that you're not forgiving them. Forgiveness is just as much for us as it is for the other person. And then the third one is like bullying. So in the moment, sometimes bullying seems like the right thing to do, uh, or it sounds like it feels like it would make you uh, more liked or more popular. Uh, but really, one, you're putting down somebody who's made in the image of God. And two, eventually, people are, you're going to have that reputation again. And you're not going to, people aren't going to want to be around you. And a lot of these things are things that would make you quote unquote popular. And I've already talked with people about where popular popularity gets you. Like I've talked to many people already about how they feel like popularity isn't all it's cracked up to be, that um, they feel more alone now than ever, and no one actually knows the real them. And that is where temptation and like, Choosing to sin will get you. So then how do we proceed with all this? We're supposed to lay down our lives and follow Christ. And it's not about us, it's about Jesus. See, pride and sin to the world are like good things. Like, oh, you're all about yourself. Awesome. Great job. But that's just the equivalent of praising something that is slowly taking you down a bad path and killing you. So now, let's talk about the fallout of Adam and Eve, that situation. The real reason Adam and Eve, again, the act was so bad is not because they ate a fruit. It was because they chose to defy God. They chose to go against what God told them. So, first, sin and death enter the world now. So, death and sickness are a thing. It says in Genesis 3.19, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are and dust you will return. See, our choice represented, uh, resulted in separation from God, a disrupted relationship. Adam and Eve, once they, their eyes are open, in Genesis 3.8, it says that they hid from God because their, their sin made them ashamed. And once they have this broken relationship with God, then they don't, why are they even in the garden in the first place? Because they don't have that relationship anymore. So for the, and it also distorted our image is the other piece. Because remember, you can't know God, and you can't know what it means to be made in the image of God if you don't know God. And with this disrupted relationship we, ha- we had, it made that impossible. So the rest of the month, we're going to be talking about the fallouts that come with the fall. Like the things that went down and what, what's going on. Uh, in the fall. That's what we're talking about the rest of the month. So next week, Mrs. Barnett is talking. 
and then the week after, Ms. Reed is talking. And then the week after that, we're going to have a, a panel with all of our teachers talking about fallouts that they have the hardest time with. And that's what we're doing for the rest of the month. Um, but I don't want to leave you like on this not super happy note, because the fall is a tough thing to talk about. So I want to give you some hope. Because, and this is spoilers for next month, but no amount of self-improvement you trying to fix yourself can ever undo what is done. That doesn't fix you. The more you try to fix yourself by yourself, actually the worse it gets for you. And that's why what Jesus did was so important. So when we talk about what is our problem, it is that sin is slowly killing us. But God's game plan is that Jesus died to pay the price to remove this curse for, from us. He gave us a way to know him if we choose, and he gave us the Holy Spirit to live within us so that we can do better than Adam and Eve can. And we're going to mess up, we're going to fall short, but we're going to learn, and we're going to grow as we do. The last thing that I want us to see um, is that a lot of times after talking about this, uh, there's three questions, and they kind of actually go in order. Um, so why did God allow the fall to happen is the first thing. And then like it turns into, why does God allow evil? And then it turns into, why do bad things happen to good people? Is the way that that goes. And I want to talk through like a couple things real quick. The first is free will. So if Mrs. Barnett, where are you, by the way? I know I like to embarrass you. So if Mrs. Barnett and I never met, and I just went up to her and I said, you love me now and we're married. That's not love, is it? That's not actually love. And God wanted us the same way. He didn't want us to have no choice but to love him. He wanted us to have the free will to choose him, which means the reality is that we're not always got to choose them. And that's when a lot of the pain and bad things happen to us. Not always, but that's when a lot of the bad things happen to us is when other people choose not to follow God and do things that hurt you. But then also, like, when you mess up yourself, uh, if you're truly repentant, God forgives you, but that doesn't spare you from earthly consequences. I usually say it like this when I was in class, like, Anybody that's in prison can choose God. Anybody who like, truly repents and wants to be with God can choose God, and they're forgiven by God, but that doesn't mean they'll get out of jail because they still have the consequences of whatever actions that they did. And then the other piece that I want you guys to think about is eternity. Um, if you were in 7th or 8th grade, I was in your classes, and we talked about eternity, but we're only here for a very little amount of time, right? And in that little amount of time, that's who we're shaped for all of eternity. That's where we're shaped for all of eternity. And think about it. If you never faced a fearful situation, a scary situation, uh, you would never have the quality of courageous. You would never be able to show that. If you never uh, had to face a tough time where you had to choose the hard choice, even when it was going to be like get you in trouble, you would never be dependable or trustworthy. Like you would never have that quality. So that's another piece uh, that is why sometimes uh, bad things do happen. But a lot of times, and if you guys want to talk about this more, you can find me. But a lot of times, this is a logical argument for why bad things happen to good people. Um, it, and it makes sense, but usually this question is more emotional. Like something bad is happening to you, somebody you love is like hurt or in trouble, and that's why you're asking it. And a lot of times, no logical argument is actually going to make it better. What you need is somebody to show you the love of Jesus in your life and spend time with, the, with him in relationship is what you need. And I know it's tough going through those hard times, and we can talk about that too, but logic sometimes falls short in emotional situations where you're going through tough times.
So I wanted just to end with that. I love you all, not in a weird way. Remember, this afternoon, you guys are going to these different locations.